it's my first time at CppCon. Uh, I've thought about going for a lot of years and now kind of uh, regretting that I didn't go sooner. Uh, thank you so much for coming to my talk. My name is Timur Dumler, also known as Timur Audio on Twitter. I gotta say, it's so great to be speaking to a room with real people again. This is really, really great. Thank you so much, CppCon, for making this possible, and making this happen, and having me here. It's, it's really great. Thank you so much. Um, so, my name is Timur, and literally last week I got a new job. I'm back at JetBrains. I'm now developer advocate. So if you have any questions or want to talk about C-Line or their other C++ tools, please come and find me. Uh, the other thing that I do is I make music production software. And this is kind of where kind of the motivation for this talk um, came from. It's called Real-Time Programming with the Standard Library, although I should say that real-time should really be in quotes. And we're going to talk later about why that is. Or actually, we're going to talk about it now. Let's talk about what do we mean by real-time. And the other uh, kind of phrase or word that um, often is mentioned in that context is low latency. So what does real time have to do with low latency? Well, uh, if you think of uh, you know, a program uh, that is processing some data as like a pipe, um, that kind of data is flowing through, then we really have these two orthogonal aspects of performance. We have bandwidth or throughput and we have latency, right? And the, the throughput is kind of like how much data you can uh, process in a given amount of time. So you want to like, that's kind of more like how performant you are, kind of an average, how much work can you do? And then you have the latency, which is how much time does it take when you ask a question before you get an answer? And uh, these are kind of the orthogonal kind of aspects of performance. And in this talk, we don't really care about bandwidth or throughput so much because uh, the amounts of data that we're dealing with are not very high, but we really do care about the latency. And what real-time really means is that we want to put an upper bound on how long this latency can be. And so in first approximation, you know, what does it mean to be real-time? It means that in order to be considered correct, not only does your program have to produce the correct result, but it also has to produce it within a certain amount of time. What are areas where you encounter constraints like this? Well, it's stuff like high-frequency trading, embedded devices, if you're making cars or robots, it's video games and it's audio processing, which is kind of one of the things that I'm doing. And um, I don't want to talk about audio too much. I just want to just have a few slides just kind of to talk about the use case. So basically what's happening is that uh, you get a callback from your sound card, um, which is called process, typically a process something, and then you get a buffer and you need to write audio data into that buffer. And then it's going to be sent out uh, to the speakers and played back a sound. Or like the other way around, if you're recording something, it's going to come in from the mic. And you're going to get repeated audio callbacks. Um, so you write more and more and more audio uh, data, which is going to be um, played back. And typically, uh, you get these audio callbacks on a high priority thread, which we also call the real-time thread. And uh, these callbacks count regular intervals. And the time interval between two subsequent callbacks, depending on your uh, audio settings, like buffer size, sample rate, that kind of stuff, uh, it's typically somewhere between one and 10 milliseconds. And so the thing here is that if you fail to write your audio data into a buffer within this one to 10 milliseconds, and then the next callback comes around, you're gonna have garbage data in your buffer, and then that's gonna be played back by the speaker, and then you're gonna have an audible glitch or click or something like that, and nobody's gonna buy your software. Um, so we really shouldn't miss our deadline. And this use case is, I would say, a little bit different from other low latency um, use cases, like, for example, uh, trading. Like, in high-frequency high frequency trading, I think it really matters if something takes, let's say, one microsecond or 1.1 microseconds, right? Because you really want to be the fastest, and if you are not, then you can lose millions of dollars. In this scenario, you don't really care that much if something takes 10 microseconds or 11 microseconds. But what you do really care about is that it takes no more than 11 microseconds 100% of the time. There isn't ever like one in a million like a times uh, a case where it takes 1,000 microseconds. So that's exactly not what you want. Um, so basically, we need to optimize for the worst case, not for the average case. 
And so for this kind of use case, um, why real time is in quotes is because typically if you make something like video games or audio processing, we're not actually on a RTOS, we're not on a real time operating system where we have like, you know, if you're building airplanes or something like this, where you have like a deterministic threat schedule and actually can reason about physical time. No, we have a normal operating system like Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Linux, Android, right? Um, and often we actually want to deploy to all of these platforms. So we are cross-platform. We also really care about uh, portability. Um, and what these normal operating systems do is they give you a high priority thread. Um, and then you're just going to have to hope that the uh, thread scheduler of that operating system is going to do the right thing, which, you know, it does. But this is why real time is in quotes, because it's not really like enforced like in any way. You have to trust the thread scheduler. Uh, you're typically on a normal consumer machine like this laptop or like a phone or something. We're using a normal C++ implementation like the usual compilers. Uh, so nothing special here. And sometimes what happens is that also only parts of your program are subject actually to these real-time constraints. So for example, you can have one, uh, like in a piece of audio software or in a video game, you have like one thread that is producing this audio data with real-time constraints, but then you also have a GUI, you have like input from the mouse or the network or other stuff going on where you don't have these deadlines, right? So, and then you need to kind of synchronize all of this stuff. So, but if you are on this high priority thread of this real-time, this real-time callback, uh, you're gonna do stuff in there, right? You're gonna produce some audio, for example, or whatever else it is that you're doing, and you're gonna call functions in there. Like for example, here you want to, uh, you know, generate some audio samples, you want to apply some gain, maybe there's like a volume knob somewhere, so you want to make it louder or less loud or something. So we're calling some functions in there, we're we are running some code. And the question here, here is, can you call these functions uh, inside this callback without causing this audio glitch, without missing your deadline? In other words, are these functions that you're calling real-time safe? And this is kind of the term that we're going to be using throughout this talk. So what's real-time safe code? And as I said, we don't care about the average time so much. I mean, we do, but we really care about the worst case execution time. And what we need to do is we need to make sure that the worst case execution time of any of these functions is deterministic, is known in advance, is not going to uh, increase because of some you know, data input that you don't know what that's going to be, and that that upper limit is going to be shorter than the deadline that you have. And the other thing is that important is that the code shouldn't fail, right? It shouldn't throw an exception and take some other code path, right? So obviously something can go wrong always in code. Um, so like it doesn't mean that it needs to like, so you can have like, you know, error handling mechanisms and stuff like that. But what you need to do is you need to make, make sure that if something goes wrong, you can still write some meaningful results or return some meaningful result within that deadline. Also this kind of known in advance, uh, it's kind of like known in principle, right? So you don't have to like micro benchmark every function that you call and know exactly how many microseconds it takes. It's more like uh, it should be knowable, right? So like, and that's a property. These properties are kind of, in, can be inferred by just kind of looking at what the function does and looking at the code and looking at the properties of that code. And what properties does code need to have in order to be considered real-time safe? Well, you shouldn't call anything that might block Right, so you shouldn't wait on a mutex because one, you don't know how long that's going to take. You don't know what the other thread is doing that holds the mutex, and two, uh, that other thread might actually be lower priority than the thread that you're on. So you get this problem of priority inversion. So not only can you not directly acquire a mutex, you can also not do anything that acquires a mutex inside. You cannot allocate or deallocate dynamic memory. That's not a thing on the real-time thread. You can't do any input output. You can't interact with the thread schedule. You can't really do any system calls because you don't know what's going to happen there. You can't actually really call any third party code if you don't know exactly what's going to happen there and you don't know that you know, this is not going to try to acquire mutex, it's not going to do any stuff that has non-deterministic execution time. And you also can't really call algorithms that have kind of worse than constant complexity. In particular, you can't use algorithms that have amortized constant complexity, like the typical Typical example is like a hash map, right? Inserting insertion into a hash map is most of the time it's constant complexity, but every once in a while the hash map is going to be like, oh, okay, I have a hash collision, I need to like rehash all my all my contents, and that's going to take like a hundred times longer, and then you get your your glitch, right? And you miss your deadline, so you can't really do that. Now, um, you might, uh, depending on what other talks you've you've seen uh, this week, you might say, hmm, this this. Um, 
sounds a little bit familiar. Is this the same as freestanding C++? Or like the other word for it is kind of hosted and non-hosting implementation, which has been touched upon uh, several times this week, which is basically this uh, kind of idea of a C++ running on like a bare metal embedded system or something. Um, and um, so there is this notion of um, non-hosted implementation in the standard, and there actually have been quite a few uh, proposals by Ben Craig. There's a lot of work being done on this to define what subset of the C++ language that is, what subset of the C++ language is kind of okay for these like freestanding systems. Uh, turns out it's not quite the same subset of the language. And I can draw this kind of little Venn diagram. So um, yes, uh, there is kind of an overlap. So in both cases, you, you, know, you don't want to use locks or you don't have locks. Uh, you know, you don't have, you don't want to allocate, deallocate dynamic memory, do I.O., do exceptions, that kind of stuff. But uh, it's still like not quite the same, right? So on a bare metal system, often you don't have floating point numbers. You don't have a heap. Like if you want to do real time safe code on like a kind of desktop system or on a phone, you do have these things. On the other hand, you do have this uh, kind of deadline thing. So you can't call algorithms which are like amortized or linear or worse than that. Um, and the biggest difference between these two is basically that on freestanding, you're saying these things do not exist. We are on a system that doesn't have these things. Whereas if you're doing real time uh, kind of applications like games or audio, you're saying, well, these things do exist because we're just on a normal C++ implementation, but you're just not supposed to use them uh, like on the processing thread, for example, if you don't want to miss your deadline, right? So it's not quite, quite the same thing. And so um, there are a bunch of talks um, already out there um, about how to like program in this style if you consider this like blue uh, circle in the Venn diagram. So I'm not going to talk too much about like this general Thing. What I'm going to talk about specifically is the C++ standard library, the way it comes out of the box with your C++ compiler. And what subset of the C++ standard library is in this set of kind of real-time safe code? So in other words, what parts of the C++ standard library are real-time safe with this definition of real-time safe in quotes that we have earlier? And obviously, we won't go through every function and every class in a standard library because we don't have that much time. But I will mention a few like particularly common or particularly interesting cases. And more importantly, I'll tell you how to squint at the C++ standard, like the specification, in such a way that you can actually figure out on your own which bits are real-time safe and which are not. And that's kind of really the goal of the talk. So let's talk about the standard. Well, turns out the C++ standard says nothing about execution time, right? It says in some places stuff about complexity of an algorithm. But it doesn't say anywhere, well, this function is going to like take that much time or something like that. That's not a thing that the standard does. The C++ standard also doesn't really say anywhere, um, you know, the function f in the standard library doesn't allocate memory. You don't really, I mean, you may fi find this maybe in one or two places, but it's not really a thing that the standard talks about very much when it talks about library functions. Uh, what you kind of have to do is you have to infer from the specifications that allocations are not needed in order to implement this, right? And sometimes there are useful sentences in a spec, like f might invalidate iterators, which might tell you, OK, it's going to maybe reallocate the contents of that container. Or um, if there is enough memory, f does this, otherwise it does that, which again tells you it's going to probably try to allocate memory in order to go to like the faster uh, implementation or something like that. Um, and also the C++ standard doesn't say class x doesn't use locks inside. It says x may not be accessed from multiple threads simultaneously, which tells you, OK, it's not thread safe, so it's not going to have locks on site, so that's probably OK. Or the standard might say, x may not introduce data races. And then you know, OK, there's probably going to be locks in there. So using the st standard library for real-time safe code isn't really an exact science, right? So we kind of have to rely on the quality of implementation, that the implementation is not going to do something that's not required. It's not going to do something worse. It's not going to like allocate memory where it's just not needed. So we kind of have to rely on the quality of implementation here, just the same way we have to rely on the quality of implementation of the operating system, like the thread scheduler, that is not going to just do something weird and just kind of uh, you know, not call our uh, high priority thread in time, and so we, we, we can't get our results that way. OK, so first feature I want to talk about are exceptions. And they're kind of a core language feature, but a lot of the standard library uses exceptions. And 
uh, well, it should be obvious that exceptions are not real-time safe. Uh, there is work, or there has been work done to change this. In particular, Herb Sata was here on this stage two years ago presenting his proposal um, uh, Zero Overhead Deterministic Exceptions, uh, which is like a new model uh, of exceptions which uh, you know, wouldn't have the problems that we have today in terms of uh, performance. But you know, the sentence, the important sentence about where we live today is right here in the abstract of that paper. Today's exceptions uh, do not have statically boundable time costs. In particular, throw requires dynamic allocation, right? At least on some systems. So you can basically stop thinking about exceptions at this point. Uh, except, um, actually, a good friend of mine, Fabian Van Giles, asked me this uh, question. Well, but if we don't throw the exception, if we just have a try block and we enter and leave the try block, but we're not ever actually throwing an exception, is that real time safe? And I was like, I, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't actually know. And so that turned out to be a massive rabbit hole. Um, so it turns out this, um, basically, you need to uh, think about like how exceptions are implemented under the hood. And that depends on the ABI. Turns out, uh, in order to like um, do exceptions, you need some information, right? You need like information how to unwind the stack and deal with the exception and stuff like that. And there are basically two ways you can do this. You can generate all this information up front, uh, like at compile time, and store it like in a static table, which is going to increase your binary size. Or you can generate this information at runtime, you know, when you're entering a try block. And so those are really the, the kind of two models, like greatly oversimplified. And um, the first model is also called the zero cost exception model. Um, and that's actually followed by pretty much every platform or most platforms you care about, so GCC Clang, Windows 64-bit, ARM, both 32-bit and 64-bit. Um, and the idea here is that, yes, you have this information kind of uh, in the binary, so it's going to increase binary size. But when you enter a try block, you don't have to uh, do any work if you're not throwing an exception. So it's going to be expensive to throw the exception, but if you never ever throw an exception, you're not paying uh, any performance cost uh, for that. This is kind of the idea. It's like, if you want to be pedantic, it's of course not quite like that, because if you benchmark this kind of stuff, what do you compare it to? Do you compare it to like not having an error handling mechanism? Do you compare it to like returning error codes? And also the kind of sad path, uh, like the code for that is still there, so it might interfere with optimization. So, but like overall, I would say um, it's fair to say that there's pretty much no runtime overhead uh, on these platforms. Um, or no, no practically relevant runtime overhead in most cases, um, if you're not ever throwing the exception, so that's fine. Microsoft uh, Windows 32-bit is different. Uh, that's going to create a bunch of code at runtime, uh, even if you just enter a try block. Uh, so it's going to like uh, emit a bunch of instructions. It's going to write some like thread local data into some weird places in memory. So you're paying. Uh, a sig measurable significant runtime cost just for entering and leaving a try block, even if you're not um, uh, throwing an exception. But if you look at what's happening there, it's all kind of thread local data. It's not anything like dynamic memory allocations or you know stuff like that. So yes, on this particular platform, you are paying a uh, performance cost, but there's nothing in there, uh, as far as I can see, that's not real-time safe. So there's no allocations or anything like that. There, sorry, could you please go to the mic if you have a question? Otherwise, it's not going to be on the video. I'm sorry, could you please use the mic if you have a question? A B A B I, what does I mean? Sorry. Oh, A B I means uh, with binary interface. Like if you compile, uh, if you compile code into a binary, like how. Basically, how do you, uh, how does C++ code be uh, going to be turned into machine instructions, basically? Uh, and that's different, like, on every platform. Um, right, so I can conclude that, is it real-time safe to enter and leave a try block if you don't throw any exceptions? Yes. It's practically zero cost on most platforms, not on all of them but it appears to be real-time safe on every platform that I'm familiar with. I don't know what happens if you have an exotic uh, kind of embedded platform with like a very different ABI, I, I don't know. 
Um, if you want to know more about this uh, and like kind of actually the uh, kind of performance overhead of uh, uh, exceptions, there is this paper by Ben Craig. I can recommend you to um, to read that. Uh, that's really cool. Okay, we talked about exceptions. Let's talk about STL algorithms. What STL algorithms are real-time safe? Is std sort real-time safe? Is std rotate real-time safe? And what I mean by real-time safe is like the algorithm excel itself. Like obviously if the element type is like a std string and you're gonna copy that around, you're gonna have allocations or like if the iterators you're using are like you know, vector back inserters or O-stream iterators or stuff like that, that's not going to be real-time safe. Uh, but if you're dealing with ints or something like this, um, like is the actual algorithm, like the loop inside the algorithm, is that going to allocate memory? And the standard doesn't say, of course. But for almost all of the standard uh, algorithms, an optimal implementation of the specification as it is in the standard does not require additional allocations. So you can assume that they're not gonna be there. There are a few algorithms where that's not the case. But you can spot them, because when you look at the specification in the standard, they're going to have these magic words in there. If enough extra memory is available, this algorithm is doing this. Otherwise, it's going to do something else. And whenever you see those words, um, that means, yeah, it's going to allocate some kind of uh, dynamic uh, uh, temporary buffer in order to fall into a uh, kind of fallback, not fallback, but like use a faster implementation. And if it can't allocate memory, it's gonna fall back to a slower implementation. And that is the case for exactly three uh, algorithms in the standard. Stable sort, stable partition, and in-place merge. Now, these are not the most common ones, at least like in stuff like audio code, like the one that I have probably seen in real life is stable sort, if you have some kind of complex audio engine or something like that. So please don't use stable sort in there because it's gonna allocate memory. Uh, and obviously the parallel algorithms, right? Because they're parallel, because they're gonna do like parallel stuff, uh, synchronization. Okay, what about STL containers? We talked about algorithms, what about containers? Um, Stid array obviously is on the stack, so that's real-time safe. That's kind of the best, most efficient thing you can do. All the other STL containers use dynamic memory. Okay, but what if you do need a dynamically sized container on the real-time thread? Because a lot of the time you do. So one thing that I have seen in practice quite a few times is this kind of stuff. It's called a variable length array. Basically, it's a C array with a runtime size, and you can do that in C, and you can do that in C++ on GCC and Clang. Um, and I've seen a lot of like, audio DSP engineers do that. But it turns out it doesn't compile on Windows because it's not actually standard C++. That's not part of the C++ language. Uh, in C++, array size needs to be static, so that's not gonna compile. And actually, I once had a code base uh, where uh, like a bunch of audio algorithms, and it was full of VLAs. And uh, even though the developer was saying, yeah, 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 it's all portable, um, so I had to actually go in and replace every VLA manually with like a different data structure, which was a pain in the neck, so very painful in order to port it to Windows. So that's not great. What else could we do? We could use SDL containers with custom allocators, right? We can do that. The standard allows us to do that. All right. Uh, what allocators are going to use? Um, well, there are a bunch of kind of general purpose allocators out there, like TC malloc, RP malloc, and others. Turns out they're not really real-time safe because that's not what they're made for. They're made to make uh, allocations cheaper on average, right? Like if you, for example, run a web server and you have to handle requests, right, and you have to allocate memory, then you really care about the average case. You want allocations to be faster. But uh, we care about the worst case, right? So these things, they're typically uh, not constant time to allocate memory. They typically are multi-threaded, so you have blocks inside. And they all eventually go to the operating system to actually request more dynamic memory. So that is not something we can do on a real-time thread. What we need, if you want to do a real-time safe allocator, is we need an allocator that allocates memory in constant time, just single-threaded, so we don't have any locks in there or anything, and that only uses memory that we allocated up front, because you can't actually allocate any new dynamic memory uh, like in, in, the, in this like processing thread, right? Turns out, we do actually have not one, but several such allocators in the C++ standard library, which is great. So we have this thing called std PMR monotonic buffer resource, and that's really cool. So let's say you have um, some memory um, kind of allocated up front, like here, it's just like a block of memory on the stack, like stack memory. 
So you pass this to monotonic buffer recess, and what it's going to do, it's basically going to like take this block, and whenever you want to allocate memory, it's going to like give you a chunk from that block and advance the head pointer, right? And then um, deallocation is basically doing nothing. Uh, and then once it hit the end uh, of that pre-allocated buffer, it's going to fall back to um, the upstream allocator, which is the uh, third uh, constructor argument here. So then you can give it an allocator to go to to request more memory. And what we do here is we give it this other allocator, which is in the standard library, which is called the null memory resource, which is not ever going to allocate anything, but whenever you, whenever you like uh, try to allocate memory with that, it's just going to throw bad alloc and say, nope. And that is real-time safe, right? And it's not only real-time safe, but it's also uh, really uh, cache-friendly because it's basically one block of memory. So, so that's really interesting. I mean, this wasn't really actually designed for like real-time stuff because like it's designed to kind of just make make allocations kind of faster. But if you combine it with like me non-memory resource, we can use it in that way. And that is that is we got a working uh, real-time safe allocator, which is which is great. And now we can go ahead and uh, construct an allocator object with that memory resource. And then we can construct our PMR vector uh, with that allocator, give it, give it that allocator. And now we have a real-time safe vector, which is great. Um, and that's kind of cool. I actually double-checked with Pablo Halpern, who is the author of the PMR, who is here at the conference, to make sure I got it, it right. Um, and he confirmed, yes, this is good. And there's actually one thing which is even better. We have a third allocator in a standard library, which is the std PMR unsynchronized pool resource, which is a little bit of a more complex uh, thing. So uh, basically the idea is that you have a pool. Uh, it has these pools of memory that it manages, and it has one pool for every um, kind of allocation size. And the pools have chunks, and the chunks have blocks. And then when you uh, request memory, it's going to go to the pool. It's going to you know, allocate a new chunk, and it's going to give you a block from that chunk. Uh, and so that's. Uh, has some overhead in space compared to like the simple monotonic buffer resource because you have to do some bookkeeping. Um, but it's still pretty lightweight. Uh, it still uh, is kind of constant time, uh, constant time allocation uh, if you implement it right, except when you need to allocate a new chunk. And then, you know, the anchor synchronized pool resource again has an upstream iterator which it goes to if it needs actually, if it actually needs more memory, if it actually needs to allocate a new chunk. And so what you do here is in order to uh, basically avoid going to the operating system, you give it the monotonic buffer resource as the upstream operator, uh, as the upstream allocator, sorry. So now you have this unsynchronized pool resource, which as its upstream iterator uses the monotonic buffer resource, which is handling pre-allocated memory, which then itself as its upstream iterator uses the non-memory resource. And now you have a really cool um, kind of single-threaded, uh, real-time safe, um, very cache-friendly allocator, which is not actually going to allocate any memory, um, like at runtime, but it's going to manage this like, pre-allocated uh, uh, chunk of memory in this really cool way. And if you use the pool, uh, then also you get deallocations, right? So it's not just like, OK, we're out of memory, we're done. So it can also recycle these, these chunks, right? And it has stuff for that. So yeah, as I said, um, we're using the monotonic buffer resource here as the fallback for the unsynchronized pool resource, and then we use the non-memory non resource as the, as the fallback from that. But uh, OK, so that's really cool, and that's real-time safe. But um, if you just want a real-time safe vector, even like PMR vector with the monotonic buffer resource, it's a little bit of overkill, I would say. It's a little bit of a uh, waste of time and memory. You can use something more efficient. Uh, you can use a static vector. What a static vector is, is basically a vector which just, um, where, which has a fixed capacity. The capacity is fixed at runtime, uh, sorry, at compile time. And then it just manages all the data on the stack within itself. Um, so it's smaller because everything is just kind of on the, on the stack in one, in one block of memory. It's faster. Uh, you don't have this kind of indirection. Um, there's no need to construct an allocator object outside of that vector, which gets kind of weird because vector has value semantics, the allocator has kind of reference semantics, it's just like outside objects, so it, you get weird, it, it gets a bit weird. Um, so turns out you don't need to do anything. Uh, we saw a talk this week by David Stone, how to do this correctly, implementing static vector, great talk, recommend you check it out. 
And there's also a proposal uh, to get static vector into the standard library, so I really hope that we will get it eventually. At the moment, it's not in the standard, so you have to roll your own or you have to use a third-party implementation. Okay, so this is the state, and the same if you're, um, if you're using other containers like map or set. Uh, obviously, you could construct a map with this like real-time safe allocator thing, uh, but also there's things like flat map, which is kind of probably a better idea. Okay, we talked about containers. Let's talk about other utilities that we have in the standard. Which of those are real-time safe? Well, obviously, we have uh, std pair and std tuple. They're both on the stack, so they're obviously real-time safe. We have std optional, which is just a value in a bool, essentially, on the stack. So that is also real-time safe. And we have std variant, which is under the hood, basically just a union on the stack. So this is also real-time safe, except that variant actually is really, really interesting because it depends on how you specify it, whether it's real-time safe or not. So it turns out std variant actually is real-time safe, whereas boost variant is not. And that is due to a subtle difference in the way they're specified. Let me talk about this a little bit because I think this is interesting. This is the kind of stuff that you need to like uh, be aware of when you try to figure out if something's real-time safe or not. So let's say we have this weird class that um, throws an exception when you construct it, right? It's just a toy example here. Now we have a variant of an int at this weird, uh, this weird kind of object. Uh, you um, write an int into it, so now the variant holds an int, everything's fine. And now the next thing that you do is you try to put one of those thingies into the variant that throw when you try to do that. So now the constructor of that object has failed, right? What value does the optional, uh, sorry, does the variant now hold? Does anyone know? Yeah, you know the standard, good stuff. So the problem with the boost implementation is that the boost uh, variant has what we call the strong exception guarantee, like vector pushback has the same thing. Like if something like this goes wrong, it's going to guarantee you that it's going to roll back to the state it had before, right? So it's going to basically still hold an int. So that's what the boost variant gives you. But in order to implement that, you need to back up the old value before you write the new value, and then so you can restore it if something goes wrong. And the way boost does this backup is by allocating a temporary buffer on the heap which is not real-time safe. Luckily, the standard variant is defined in a different way. It doesn't have the strong exception guarantee. So if writing this other um, kind of object into the variant fails, it's not going to roll back to the end, which means it doesn't have to back it up, which means it doesn't have to have a temporary buffer, which means it doesn't have to do an allocation, um, which means it's real-time safe, right? It's just going to be valueless by exception. Uh, in this case, it's just going to have the special value, ooh, something went wrong. So by providing fewer guarantees, you can squeeze out more performance. And this is something that you encounter a lot with utilities like this. Okay, so we talked about variant. Um, what about other utilities in the standard library? Everything that's using type erasure is not real-time safe because that's typically uh, going to um, store its content on the heap, so it's going to do dynamic map allocations. So studany stores the underlying object on the heap. You might get like a small object optimization, but you don't know how much that is. It's not portable, you know, it's not part of the spec. So you can't really rely on that if you're cross-platform. std function, same thing. Um, it's going to allocate uh, memory on the heap. It's not real-time safe. std function actually was supposed to be allocator aware. But that never really worked, and so in C17, the committee just removed that again, so now it's not having allocator support anymore. There is a proposal somewhere uh, for a class called inplace function, which basically is to std function what static vector is to std vector, so that's pretty cool, but it's not in the standard. All right. We're talking about functions, let's talk about other types of functions, let's talk about lambdas. And so, lambdas are not really a library feature, right? They're a language feature, but I kind of want to mention them because I want to dispel a myth here, which I hear, I heard several times, at least in the audio community. People were saying that lambdas somehow are allocated dynamically on the heap. So that's not true. Like the standard says what happens when you create a lambda, and the lambda is on the stack. So if you do something like this, where you have a lambda, you know, as a, as a local variable or as a member variable, and you're not doing anything like, if you're capturing stuff by value, like here, 
Uh, you're not doing anything that's not real-time safe there. Like you're not copying std strings. You're not capturing std strings by value, which obviously will allocate memory. If you're not doing anything like this, this will always be real-time safe because the lambda is going to be allocated on the stack. So that's that's safe. Of course, if you then pass that lambda to another function, if that lambda then gets passed by std function, that doesn't help you because then that's going to allocate memory. So you shouldn't do that. Uh, if you pass this lambda to another function, you should template that on a function type and then you're not going to pay for an allocation in order to be real-time safe. So lambdas, if you use them correctly, are real-time safe. And we have another type of function uh, in the standard library as of C++20. We have coroutines. For example, here's a very simple coroutine that just generates the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3. Is that real-time safe? If you create it and then you call it, Anyone know? Nope. nope. That may perform a dynamic allocation. So in general, the way coroutines are specified is that creating a coroutine frame, which is what you're doing in this line, will in general allocate heap memory. Um, because the compiler doesn't know upfront like how large that's going to be and because of other reasons. So that is going to alloc allocate dynamic memory. So in a simple case like this, and in a lot of other cases, the compiler can actually see through what you're doing, and it can optimize away this dynamic memory allocation, but you can't really rely on that portably, right? So what are your options? Well, you could rely on the optimizer, and we saw a talk earlier this week by Eyal, um, how far you can get with that, and it turns out you can get pretty far with that. But obviously you still have to look at what your compiler is doing, so it's just not portable. One thing you could do is if you have like, you know, some part of your program where you're not, you don't have to be real-time safe, you can create your coroutine there and then suspend it and then later you can call it in a real-time thread. So for some use cases that might work. Something that's a little bit more involved is you could, you know, write your own promise type and then in there you can uh, define your own custom operator new and operator delete, which then might do something else that doesn't involve going to the US to allocate dynamic memory, which is a lot of work. But uh, yes, it also kind of works. Um, or, which is what unfortunately I think a lot of people are going to be doing who are doing real-time stuff, is you can just not use coroutines, which I think is a bit sad. Okay, what else do we have in the standard library? We have a huge library uh, with uh, synchronization primitives and synchronization tools, right? So we, since C++11, we had mutexes, we had locks, uh, now since C++ 20, we have more stuff. We have uh, semaphores, latches, barriers. We have all kinds of great stuff. Turns out none of this stuff is portably real-time safe because in general, all of these things will in some way or another interact with the threat scheduler or interact with the system. And so you can't use them, not portably anyway. And I still people see people do that. For example, this is a particular pattern that I have seen in audio code in production quite a few times, where people are saying, well, we can't lock a mutex, that's not real-time safe, but we can do try to lock, right? That's not going to block. And if we succeed, if we acquire the mutex, we can do our processing. Um, and if we fail, it's not going to wait, it's going to immediately return false, so then we can fall back to some kind of fallback strategy, we can just write like zeros into the buffer, which is going to produce silence, something like that. And it turns out, yes, the call to try to lock is real-time safe, but you have a problem once you get to this closing brace. So if you acquire the mutex and then another thread might wait on it, and then you get to this closing brace in your uh, real-time thread, you gotta wake up the other thread, right? And that might be efficient on some platforms and there was like recently a discussion by some Linux kernel experts whether this is fine or not in this particular operating system which they kind of disagreed upon. But it's definitely not portably real-time safe to do this kind of stuff. And that's kind of really the end of the story. So. C++ only really has exactly one synchronization primitive in the language, which is real-time safe. Only one mechanism to synchronize threads, and that's the atomic. That's all we have. 
You can use Stidatomic on its own. If you want to share values between threads, like for single values, you can use Stidatomic as a um, primitive to build log-free structures, which is very, very powerful, which we use a lot in this kind of stuff, like log-free queues to get data in and out of the real-time thread. You can use Stidatomic uh, to build a spin lock. You can uh, also use, uh, so I have a whole talk actually that I did last year at the audio developer conference about how to um, build like an efficient spin lock, which isn't just spinning all the time and burning your CPU. Um, so you can do a lot of stuff there. Um, you gotta make sure it's lock free though, because atomic isn't the same as lock free. Atomic just means there's no data race. Uh, if you have an atomic of int or a bool or something like that on modern systems, you know, you know, there are instructions on that CPU for that, which are going to like atomic load and store and compare exchange. So that's going to be lock free. But what happens if you have an atomic of a, a slightly bigger data type? For example, uh, you might want to do atomic of complex double, right? Complex numbers are very useful for many numeric algorithms. Is this going to be real time safe? Well, Turns out it really depends on whether your architecture has native CPU instructions for atomic load store and compare exchange for this, this, this size of variable. Um, and you need to check that because what happens if uh, that static assert, if that fails, it means you, can't, you don't have the native instructions to do that. The compiler is still going to need to uh, like, um, ensure that the behavior of atomic is the, the, the way it's specified, so it's not gonna be a data race. And what the compiler is going to do is going to actually insert locks in there. And that's exactly not what you want. So you gotta have the static assert. And actually this is interesting because specifically for this one, atomic complex double, it's lock free on this MacBook here, but on the other machine that I have at home, it's not. So it really depends on the platform. Okay, I'm getting kind of close to the end of the talk. There's just one other topic I wanna talk about. Uh, it's one kind of thing that you also might want to do if you're churning numbers, which is generating random numbers. So that's, that's a good topic. So one thing that you need to do a lot if you're doing audio processing, for example, is you need to generate noise. Um, I think that's also quite common in other domains. You basically need to uh, generate a bunch of numbers, like floating point numbers between zero and one. I think that's a pretty common use case. And by far the most common implementation that I see out in the wild is this. So there's a bug here. Does anyone know what the bug is? The bug is, this can actually return one, right? We said it's a semi-open interval, but this can actually return one. So it's wrong, but that's not the problem. The, I mean, that is a problem, but there is another problem. The other problem is that people are still using stdrands to generate random numbers. And in my opinion, stdrand is completely useless. And it's not because it's a low quality random number generator, because in audio, we're typically doing something like generating noise or like humanizing some quanti you know, quantitated like events or something like this. So we don't really, we're not doing cryptography. We don't really care about the quality of the random number generator so much. But even then, stdrand is a terrible idea for at least two other reasons. Uh, let's look at how it's specified in the standard. So first of all, it says, it's not portable, which means uh, even if you seed it with the same number, it's gonna generate different sequences on different platforms, which is, you know, makes it a lot harder to write unit tests, for example. But then there's this thing here, which is a lot worse. It says it is implementation defined whether the RAND function may introduce data races. And this is exactly the stuff that you really gotta look out for when you read the standard and try to figure out if anything's real-time safe. Because what that means, in other words, is that you know, this function can contain locks inside. And, and any library facility that, that is doing this kind of stuff is definitely not real-time safe, so you can't do that. Okay, what else do we have in the language? We do have modern, a modern uh, random library, so we do have three other engines, random number generating engines in the standard. We have these three. Are these real-time safe? Let's look at the standard. It says that um, generating a random number with a standard compliant random number uh, engine has amortized constant complexity. So it's kind of like, ah, okay, can't do that. Why? I, I was kind of a bit curious. I'm not an expert on random number generation, so I went to Twitter, which is what I do a lot when I don't know something. 
And yeah, so it turns out basically for the Mazen Twister specifically, which is like probably the most popular one, it has this like massive internal state. And most of the time, it's just going to give you more and more and more numbers. But every once in a while, it's going to say, OK, now I'm going to recompute my whole internal state. And that's going to take a while. So you don't want that. OK. We have two other engines in the standard library. Specifically, we have this, this one, which is kind of linear congruential engine, which is supposed to be you know, simple. There's this equation. This is what it does. And that's kind of interesting, because the standard says that all of these engines uh, have amortized constant complexity. But if I look at this equation, like it is straightforward to implement this in constant time. So it is probably fine to use. It's probably constant time if you have implemented this properly, even if the standard says it's amortized constant time. So I have used this in production. It's fine. It's not the fastest uh, random number uh, engine. It's pretty fast. It's not the fastest. Um, I had a look the fastest uh, for this kind of stuff that there is out there. It seems to be this one. It's Zor shift. Um, so in order to generate a new random number, it's basically just a bit shift and a Zor operation. That's super, super fast. It can also be uh, you know, fast, very, very fast, uh, like on modern, on modern hardware. So in my opinion, this is probably the best random number generation uh, engine for this kind of like real-time stuff, if you don't care about like hardcore cryptographic security. This one is not in the standard. Uh, maybe I should write a proposal to get it into the standard. Um, there are a bunch of third-party implementations out there that you can use. OK, so let's say, let's pretend it were in the standard. Let's, have you ha let's say you have an implementation of it um, that conforms to kind of the interface of the kind of standard uh, random number generation. Uh, so let's, let's use this. So we still want to generate our uh, numbers between 0 and 1, right? So how do we do this with a standard random number engine? We wrap it into a uniform real distribution. And you, we give it um, kind of our bounds, like 0 and 1, semi-open semi interval. And then we call that distribution by giving it the random number generator, right? So that's how you, that's how you generate numbers between 0 and 1 in, in modern C++. All right, so we call that distribution. What is the cost of this operation? Is this operation constant time? Hmm. The standard doesn't say. The standard says that uniform distributions have at least two unfortunate properties. The first one is that it's not defined what the algorithm is, which I think is really, really unfortunate, because it means if you're using a standard random number engine like the naked one, you're guaranteed to get the same sequence on every platform. But if you wrap it into a distribution, into a standard distribution, you get a different sequence on GCC, a different sequence on Clang, a different sequence on Microsoft. It's not great. Not great for writing unit tests. Uh, and second, the standard doesn't say what complexity, what complexity uh, kind of this um, distribution has if you, if you want to generate a new number. So whenever that's the case, and whenever the standard doesn't say what the complexity is, you need to figure out what the algorithm actually does in order to figure out what the complexity is. OK, so that's kind of the work you have to do, the homework you have to do. And it turns out the study uniform distributions have amortized constant complexity. Uh, and the reason for that is that they are calling the kind of random number generator under the hood. But um, they are allowed to discard a random number and call it again. And in theory, the amount of times that they can do that is, at least the theory, it's unbounded. So I didn't really understand why. And so I went to Twitter again. And Peter Bindles actually explained it to me in a way that really, really made a lot of sense to me. Um, it's kind of intuitive if you, if you kind of read it. I'm not going to go into. Uh, details here, but basically the, the answer is uh, a uniform distribution can either be perfectly uniform, perfectly un, unbiased, or it can be constant time. But it can't be both of those things. And the standard library ones are specified to be perfectly unbiased. So they're not constant time. So what do we do? Well, we just do this again. We don't use the uniform distributions. We just use some math. Uh, so if you want a real distribution, you will typically use a division in there. If you have an interdistribution, you're going to have a modulo in there. Um, and that is not going to create a perfectly unbiased, perfectly uniform distribution. But it is real time safe, because it's just this operation, and it's going to take however much that takes every time around. 
So it always takes the same time to execute. There's still a bug. It still can return one. It's not supposed to return one. So I can do this really ugly, dirty hack to like make sure it doesn't return one. So it's definitely not a perfectly uniform distribution now. But you know, it passes all my tests. It's good enough for my use cases. So yeah, so we got to the end of the talk now. I hope I gave you a bit of a feeling of what it's like to use the standard library, the way it comes out of the box, uh, kind of for this kind of real-time stuff. Mostly it's okay to live in this world. You end up using lots of custom implementations like third-party solutions instead of the standard stuff. So that's kind of just the world we live in. It's okay. If I could have one thing, I would really like to have something like an attribute that you can slap on a function in the standard library and then the user knows, okay, that's not going to allocate memory, it's not gonna to try to acquire locks. It would be great to have that. Either in the standard or through some form of support from tools. Well, maybe one day, maybe one day. Okay, a lot of people have helped me with this material but I wanna give a special thanks to these people. Uh, they have uh, sat down with me or like, written stuff to me and uh, explained stuff to me that I didn't know before and that was very, very helpful. Uh, and actually, I wanna say kind of more broadly, um, I wanna thank kind of the community. I wanna thank every one of you because when I'm thinking about stuff like this, there is so much I don't know, but then, you know, everyone I encounter, I can just go to experts or people I just meet and they happen to be experts on this thing or they happen to know that thing or they happen to have implemented that thing. And you know, everyone's so helpful, everyone's taking that time to explain how things work and this is great. This is, this is a great way to learn. So I just wanna say thank you. It's just a great, great thing to be part of this community. Thank you very much. And I believe we have time for questions. Hey, Timo, great talk, thank you. Uh, do you distinguish in general between initialization time and runtime in real-time stuff? Do you do, I mean, you do allocation up front, do you make thread local storage, st magic statics, things like that? What kind of things do you do there? Um, it depends on the use case, I would say. Like, do you want me to talk about like audio specifically or? So specifically yeah, in, in audio, in it's kind of all at runtime, so you have, um, like if you want to output audio, you want to like say, okay, I want to do this now, like on this audio device with this sample rate, this buffer size or whatever. So you have this like initialization phase. And during this initialization phase, you have like another callback. You have like three callbacks. You have a callback. Okay, now you can set up your data and this is the way you do the work. Now you, then you get the processing callbacks. And then at the end, you get the third callback. Okay, now the device is not there anymore. Uh, you can do teardown now, basically. So this is where we do the work. But like for other use cases, you might want to do it in, at initialization time. Or you might even want to do it like at compile time and bake tables and stuff like into the binary, things like that. I think it really depends on the use case. Um, just a question about the lock acquirement. You use try lock and you said, well, when I close that function, I may be doing uh, something which is not real time safe. But if I'm knowing, if I know that all the threads are just using try locks, that means that it is real-time safe. I know that none of them is waiting on the lock. It's just try locking. If you only had ever had try locks, yes. For but this is typically not the pattern that you end up with. Like you typically have this like real-time thread, which is doing a try, try lock. And then you have like the GUI thread, for example, which is, which wants to like render something or handle an event that came from yeah, somewhere yeah, and then yeah. that's going to do a, 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 a lock, not a try lock, and that's going to be waiting. Yeah, it depends on the use case. It depends on the use case, yes, yes. Real-time threads trying to access specific mm. Yeah, frame. So, so for the typical use cases that I have seen, you always have a try lock here and a lock there and you just can't do that, that's just not safe. But yeah, there, are, there might be other use cases. I agree, it depends on the use case. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, before the random number generators, have you yeah. considered using uh, quasi-random number generators, like uh, vendor corporate sequences? I am not familiar with those. Maybe we can talk afterwards and you can tell me something about them. Sure, thank you. Hey, great talk, thank you. Uh, so you mentioned Atomics. Yes. And those are the only facilities that we have for real time. But yes. uh, what about Atomic Thread, uh, sorry, Atomic uh, Thread Fences? they're supposed to be real-time as well. 
I think it depends on how they're implemented, depends on the system, right? It depends on the CPU itself, on yeah. the system that we run on, but most of the system are just yeah. uh, some assembly operation to do the yeah. thread fence, full fence or uh, partial fence. So some, some of these things are real-time safe on some platforms, it depends on the platform. Uh, kind of where I'm coming from is I want to write portable software, so I just look at the specification, right? I, I see, is this guaranteed to be real-time safe on any like desktop or mobile platform I ever want to compile this on? So this is kind of where I'm coming from. But yes, if you are on a specific system where you know what's going on, where you know where these, how these primitives are implemented, you might have more guarantees. Yes. Thanks. Hey, uh, great talk. Um, I, after working on a bunch of audio teams, the one data structure that's always being used or recreated or pulled in or blah, blah, blah is a lock-free queue, yeah. a wait-free queue. Is there any appetite for getting that in the standard? I've literally seen it reinvented. I'd uh, love to have it in the standard. This is like literally the single most important data structure for me. Yeah. Um, I mean, it comes in like different flavors, right? It comes, you can have a single consumer, single producer, which is relatively easy to implement. Then you get like multi-producer, multi-consumer, which is horrendously complicated. Like, I don't know how to implement it correctly. I tried, I failed miserably. <laughs> um, I might give it another shot at some point, but there are implementations out there. But yeah, um, I'd love to have them in the standard. I think there was a proposal by, I think, Guy Davidson and others like years ago. Uh, I looked at it, it wasn't quite the interface that I would have expected. I think they were coming from like slightly different use cases. But yeah, maybe we should pick that up again. The problem with log queues though is that they're kind of very, um, there's a lot of stuff you can do. It kind of also depends on use case, right? So for example, what do you do if the queue is full? And for some use cases, you're like, okay, we're done, you know, it's an error. Or for some use cases, it's like, it's just fine to just drop this. We're just not gonna insert this, it's fine. Or for other use cases, it's like, okay, now I want to start overwriting the old ones, right? So you can just, it's, just, it's, it's like a combinatorial explosion of different things you might want to be doing with that log-free queue. It really depends on the use case. So there are some very common ones, like for example, getting a stream of buffers in and out of the audio thread, stuff like this, where like, yeah, just use this, you know? And yeah, it would be useful to have that in the standard. I think it would be a lot of work to pick up those proposals again uh, and kind of get them into shape and like, get them back into the committee, which is very busy with other things. But yeah, if anyone wants to help doing that work, I would love to have it in the standard. Be a, be a hero to the audio yeah. uh, community and write a proposal. Yeah, we have Guy Davidson here in chat. He says the proposal is still alive. Oh, okay, Guy Davidson says the proposal is still alive. Amazing. Please bring it back. Uh, let me know if you need any help. I would love to have it. Uh, you mentioned uh, real time thread and uh, regular thread. Sorry, so, you, I mentioned what? Can you, uh, you repeat, You please? mentioned uh, real, uh, real time thread. Real time thread, yes. And uh, regular thread. Yes. So in the multi threaded system, how do you guarantee the real time thread get the processor time during a, a, a quantum or during a window? Can you set the window to say every one millisecond, uh, okay. real time thread always get the CPU? So that, again, depends on the use case and depends on the platform. I believe, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe if you have like a real-time operating system, you can do this kind of stuff. Or you can at least, because you have like a deterministic threat schedule, you can at least reason about it in a way that kind of you can figure out when it's going to get called. If you are on any kind of uh, a desktop or like phone or like anything like that, which is kind of what I'm doing, no. Uh, you don't have any hard guarantees because the operating system has a threat scheduler, it's doing something. So the only thing you can do, like either you, I think on Windows, you create your own thread and you give it like a maximum threat priority. On macOS, you get like a threat from the operating system. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're just being told, okay, this is like, this is high priority threat and the threat scheduler is gonna do its best to, um, to like call you in regular intervals. And then it kind of depends on how good that operating system is at doing audio stuff. It works pretty well. Uh, this is why we do have, you know, audio software that um, doesn't glitch, that, you know, is good at playing back audio. But yes, you don't have hard real-time guarantees on, you know, Windows or Mac OS or Android or anything like that. Yeah, so in the real-time operating system, uh, I w used to work on this type of uh, uh, system. We use the timer, we actually okay. use the timer to yeah. guarantee every small window. Yeah. Do your time three always get this. Okay. Yeah. 
So I have not worked with a real-time operating system myself. So I, I just, oh. yeah, I, I have heard that this is what you can do there, but yeah, I work with kind of desktop and mobile. So I just, you know, okay. uh, there you can't really do stuff like that as far as I know. Okay, thanks. Hi, just a uh, comment. I wanted to make people in this space aware of the existence of the LR guarded class in the Copper Spice Lib guarded library. I was not aware of the LOR guarded class in the Copper Spice library. It provides um, uh, synchronized access to complex objects, which is lock free and deterministic time for readers. Cool. Not writers, but for readers. Let's talk more about it. That sounds very, space. very interesting. I think I'm out of time. So thank you very much for uh, coming to my talk. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, yeah, let's catch up later.